Hi, so in the previous video we looked at changes in government spending on the Keynesian model, but in that video and the ones before it, we assumed that we had a balanced budget, meaning that government spending was equal to tax revenues in every period. In this video, we are going to allow our government to run a deficit. This means that our budgets do not have to be balanced in every period. We can hold some debt in one period and then pay that off in the future. So how does this enter into our government budget constraint? Well, we have some expenditures. One of them is going to be our same expenditure on government spending. And now we are also going to have to spend on any interest on debt, which we are going to describe by this R multiplied by debt. So if we hold debt, we're going to have to pay some interest on the debt in the next period. And we then have some sources of revenue on the other side to make sure our budget constraint is equal, our expenditures are equal to our income, and we are going to get revenue from taxes still, and we can also use as a source of income just raising some debt. And this debt is D1, and our deficit, or our change in the deficit, is going to be given by this delta D1 term. So, for example, if we decide that we want to spend more in period one than we earn in taxes, then we're going to have to have some debt to finance this, and then we'll have to pay off this debt in the future. So let's continue with this thought. Let's imagine that we want to reduce our taxes in period one. So we reduce T1, but we want to keep our government spending the same in T1. This stays the same. And if we assume that we're not currently paying any interest on any debt from the past, then you can see for this equation to hold with equality, as we have assumed here, then we're going to need our deficit to increase. Quite simple, if we are changing our taxes but keeping our government spending the same, we're going to have to either borrow or raise some debt. So, okay, how now that we see how that balances, let's think about this in a bit more detail. Let's imagine that we have changed our taxes by some amount. We have changed T1. Well, this is going to have to be equal to our change in our debt, our change in D1, because clearly these are the only two things that have changed in our above equation. Our government spending has stayed the same, and our interest has stayed the same. Well, we're running a deficit in period one, then we have to pay that off in period two, which means we're going to have to change our tax revenue in period two. We're gonna to have to change T2. How much do we have to change it by to cover our debt from period one? Well, we're going to have to change it by the interest rate multiplied by our change in debt or our deficit. And this is because we are paying off the debt that we've gained from the previous period, but we also have to pay off some interest on that debt because we have an interest rate which we can borrow and save at in this economy. And we've assumed that it's the same for the government, it's the same for individuals, and that's just for simplicity. And this is also going to be equal to the negative value of our change in tax in period one multiplied by the interest rate again. And clearly this is obviously the case because if our taxes are going down, as we've said here, our deficit is going up. So our relationship between the deficit and the tax is an inverse relationship. One's negative, the other one is going to be positive. So now that we have figured out those equations and we've got this in a bit more mathematical terminology, Let's consider the effect that this has on an individual. So let's think of an individual's present value of income. We have derived this plenty of times before when we've been looking at the intertemporal budget constraint. And we said that the present value of income is equal to the individual's income in period one. But we're looking now at disposable income. So we're taking away this T1 in tax revenue and we're assuming that this is a lump sum tax, so this T1 is just taken directly away from our income, 
and we're looking at present value of income so we also look at our period two income and we are discounting this at the interest rate we've done all this before <laughs> now let's consider what happens when we have changed the tax rate in period one or we've changed our amount of taxation in period one as I have with these green equations above so we have decreased the tax rate in period one so let's let's just see what happens to our change in present value of income well we still have y1 and we were taking away this level of t1 but now we are giving back some some change in t1 we we are decreasing the tax rate which means we give we give that individual that income back we are adding this to their present value income but we have to pay this off with a change in tax in period two as a given in the second green equation so we are going to have to take away more income from individuals in period two we tax it away from them and it is by this whoops this so this green equation up here this shouldn't be a t1 here this should have been a change in t1 there, there we go um i hope you should maybe should have spotted that already that was just a bit of a typo but now, so our change in T2, we are taking away this change in T2 to pay off our change in tax in period one. So we get to this equation. Um, what we have said is that we are going to pay off our change in tax revenue in period one with our change in tax revenue in period two. So we've assumed these conditions hold above so let's substitute those into our budget constraint and see what happens uh, I'm gonna scroll down so they're no longer on the screen but you'll see how I substitute these in so we now have y1 minus t1 and as you can see up here we had just this is equal to the change in deficit one so plus change in deficit one and then again we go to this part of the equation and here we are substituting in minus one plus r change in deficit one and this is all still discounted by the interest rate because it's a present value of income now what we notice here is that we have we are dividing by one plus r here and we are multiplying by one plus r on the top of this fraction so what we can do is cancel out these terms uh, which we will do so let's just write everything out for completeness that's d1 we are keeping the disposable income here divided by 1 plus r because those two aren't multiplied by 1 plus r so we can't cancel there but we can cancel out the 1 plus r in front of the deficit term and now what we will notice is that we have a positive delta d1 here and a negative delta d1 here so we can again just cancel out these terms and what we are left with is y1 minus t1 plus y2 minus t2 over 1 plus r and that should be familiar that is what we started with as our original present value of income so why have I done this exercise in algebra to just end up back where we started? Well, it says that if we change our tax revenue today by changing T1 and finance it by tax revenue in the future, then this has no effect on present value income. And by extension, it thus has no effect on consumption choices of individuals because their present value income is completely unchanged. So then if we were to draw out an aggregate demand and supply equation like so, let's get some axes and we would write the interest rate and the income. We'd have our aggregate demand curve and our aggregate supply curve and we're initially at some output and some interest rate 
Well, what changes? Let, let's say that we, we're changing T1, and so we have to change T2 by the same, same amount so that these two balance each other out. Well, we've just said above that our present value of income is completely unchanged. So for consumers, this doesn't mean anything. So that means our aggregate demand curve here does not shift at all. And if aggregate demand doesn't shift at all, there's no change in our intertemporal labor and leisure choice. So our aggregate supply curve doesn't shift either. So if none of these sh curves shift, what it says is that nothing changes at all. Even though we've changed our government spending in different periods, it doesn't matter because our individual choices don't change. This is known as Ricardian equivalence. Ricardian equivalence. Changing taxes today don't change our output today or our interest rate today. Whoops, I labeled this on the y-axis as output. A couple of typos in this video. That should be R1 star. Um, but yeah, I change in taxes today. Don't shouldn't change our output today, because we know that this is going to be financed with a change in taxes in the future. And in our neoclassical model, our maximizing and our optimizing consumers, they value they make their decisions based on the present value of income. So they know that their future income is going to fall. So they're not going to go out partying today just because they had a change in taxes. This could also be known as the debt neutrality theorem, but what it says is that even if we take debt today out as a government, it doesn't matter. The timing of our taxes does not matter, and so only the level of government spending is important. Whether we do that in period one or period two or whenever, it does not matter. So fiscal policy here is neutral in a sense. So let's now look at whether this changes when we are thinking about the Keynesian model. Whoops, my pen had a bit of a blip there. But we're now thinking about the Keynesian model. And I won't go through lots of algebra again. But what we're going to say here is that, again, we're going to increase our taxes in period one. No, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to decrease our taxes in period one, as we did in the previous example. So we increase our taxes in period one and what this means is that we increase our taxes in period two. Well what happens in the Keynesian model? Well if we recall from the previous video we had that this demand or this aggregate demand function depended on the interest rate and it depended on y1 minus t1 i.e. it depends on our current income not our present value of income as we saw in the neoclassical model just now. So in this model, all individuals care about is that we have decreased T1. So we have effectively increased Y1 minus T1, or we have increased the current value of their income. So in the Keynesian model, we do have a shift to the right in aggregate demand to here. And that is where we end up. There's no change in supply because we are not uh, micro-founding our supply decisions. We just have some production function. Uh, so here we move to this new equilibrium with output one star and interest rate one star. So we increase our interest rate and we also increase our output in equilibrium in the Keynesian model and this arises because our individuals are not forward-looking and this is a very similar pattern to what we considered in the previous video so I won't go very much into it but we do not have the debt neutrality theorem holding here it does matter when we time our government spending and whether we pay that off in the future it does matter in a Keynesian economy because we assume that individuals are not forward-looking so we do not have Ricardian equivalents here Okay, so that just about wraps up this video. Make sure to check out the playlist for the previous and future videos. Uh, subscribe for lots of future videos and do make sure to leave a like rating if this was at all useful.